So first off, how do you make a space flight simulator? But most importantly, how do you make it right? Because what's the point of working on it when it's not going to be good? Welcome to the Open Space Program Technical Introduction. You can call me a cop you can call me Copper Teal. I, I am the benevolent dictator for life for this open source project, and I am going to try to explain everything. So in this presentation, I'm going to go over what are we doing. I'm going to go into a bit of a rant about game engines. Then I'm going to introduce the open space program code base. And then in the, the entire lower half of the presentation is going to be all about code and implementation details. But before we start, note that this presentation is intended for contributors, for game programmers, more, specific, more specifically game engine devs who are interested, and also just curious people in general. And there is going to be a bit of a minimum skill level for intermediate level programming knowledge. Like I'm, I'm going to go into things like functions and arrays, so you better know what those are. So yeah, what are we doing? Um, so we're here to make a space flight simulation game that's roughly inspired by Kerbal Space Program. For various reasons, we're not here to, and we shouldn't clone or copy KSP. But either way, make a vehicle building game with aerospace and orbital mechanics. I don't care about anything gameplay specific, you know, gameplay specific right now. I won't make any promises, though I'll explain in the next slide that there will be a lot of space for new features, because unlike a platform game or a first person shooter, this project is like 95% engineering. In order to make a space flight simulation game, you know, in order to make a space flight simulation game, we'd have to make a space flight simulator first, like a, a normal space flight simulator. And then um, that can then be used in a game because either way, we're going to have to do a lot of rocket science. Well, this is a tough one. How do you not screw this up? Um, this organization has been around since 2017. And uh, there's been many projects and rewrites associated. So that's like a couple years of trial and error. Um, <clears throat> one thing to note is that the typical game development approach will very likely fail. If you just grab a game engine off the shelf and start going at it, you'll very likely hit a wall of crushing technical depth and bugs very quickly. And you, you might find a graveyard of similar projects if you look hard enough. And we need something quite powerful to make this work. And that doesn't mean we, that, 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 doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that we have to make something ultra complicated. Maybe the opposite. So requirements, how, 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 how do you make this right? So technical decisions should minimally restrict what the, game what the game designers, the artists, and the players want. And what I mean by restrict here is to make something incredibly inconvenient. Like, you, you can technically do whatever you want to, like, you can, you can do whatever you want to and modify a piracy-protected commercial game, but it's just really hard to do that. So if you want something like N-Body versus Patch Conics, we should just support both. Leave it up to like, you know, leave it up to whoever writes the configs for the solo system. Nothing is set in stone. Like, don't ask me if there's going to be realistic turbo machinery or rocket engine cycles. It would just be easy to swap out the code for the rockets, for example. Um, soft in software means easy to change, unlike hardware or firmware. And part of this is to just not hard code the graphics and the sounds and the other art assets. Um, this has to run fast. Make it multi-threaded, make it run on a potato computer on the minimum settings. And part of this is just don't make garbage. Don't make code that makes garbage, so you don't need a garbage collector. And of course it's going to be open source, it's in the title. And uh, the individual components designed for this project should be usable in other projects. So how do we even start? So first off, we know how to make regular games. Game engines exist, we know how to load 3D models, we know how to do UI, but it's really best to consider the um, to consider the difficult parts first. So, like, how do we do a huge universe and orbital mechanics? Because making, making an orbit simulator on its own is not easy, but it is a solved problem for the most part. Now, if we want a spacecraft that can start on a surface and launch into orbit and navigate to, you know, other planets and land, now it's a hard problem. Uh, the orbit stuff has to kind of run in the background. The player experiences a conventional 3D scene, like a 3D physics game engine scene, and we're going to need to kind of synchronize the two with, you know, 
the 3D game engine and the universe simulation has to be synchronized in, so in some way. And note that the planets have to rotate. Because um, in, in the physics engine, you want your terrain and your buildings to be stationary at zero velocity. It's absolutely impractical to have everything moving at the speed of sound. So the physics scene has to be rotating relative to the entire universe. And, uh, of course, we're going to need vehicles that are made of intricate parts. Something that's modular enough so that it's really easy to add new parts. Like, and then there's problems like, how do you control the vehicles? How does fuel flow work? And etc. And most importantly, how do you tie everything together without going insane? Like, it's easy but not trivial to make, you know, again, an orbit simulation on its own. But when you actually try to come up with a way to tie together all of these different systems, then this is where programming skill issue can just make it excruciating. It's very difficult to get this right the first time, but we've already screwed it up a dozen times with years of trial and error, so don't worry about it. And this is one of the first questions that people ask, what game engine? But, um, but first, what are game engines and what do they even do? Uh, so this would give you things like platform abstractions, windowing, graphics, collisions, user interface, sound, object system. And where's the rocket science stuff? And this, and yeah, okay, it's rant time. Um, everyone knows this one. All game engines are bad. You got things like vendor lock-in. The engine will eat your entire project. All the code and the assets end up being usable only by the engine. Instead of being limited by uh, the user's hardware or programming language, we're instead limited by the engine. And there's just some things that are just fundamentally more, more difficult or more, just more complex to do. Like you'd have to cut some corners because there's something that's not available for you to use. I find that really annoying. Um, and yeah, objects and scripts are often awful at representing the problem at hand. And this, this is mostly what I'm going to be getting into. So every game engine has some kind of way of representing a world. So And usually that's some kind of hierarchy of objects. You, whether you call them game objects, entities, nodes, whatever, these kind of act, act like the glue that hold together the physics engine, the rendering, and everything else into like a common interface that can represent the world. Though I personally have a problem, pro I personally have a problem with them kind of taking over the entire project and making the code unnecessarily complex when it doesn't have to. So if you think about how to code a game of chess, for example, I like using chess because it's complex enough to overcomplicate, and I don't need to explain the rules. So. The best way to go about representing the current state of a chess game is a regular, normal 8x8 array, um, you know, for the board with a bunch of enums and integers, and like to, like to represent whose turn it is and other weird rules. And um, we, we, we can also use a list of pieces or ultra-optimized bit boards. Computer chess is a deep rabbit hole, but this is just an example. The first thing to note here, though, is that there is no need for any big bloaty game objects. The 8x8 array does the job exceptionally well, and we might as, it might as well just be the simplest and most convenient option. Uh, the second thing to note is that when you're doing things like writing code to calculate the possible moves, say when a player clicks a piece, um, consider that every move involves taking, in, taking into account all of the other pieces on a board to make sure that the move doesn't put the king in danger. This makes it um uh, yeah I forgot to hit this. This makes it impractical to write the logic for the chess pieces as individual scripts or classes. So if you look at this example here, uh, this this bishop was will be unable to move to this spot because now the the, the enemy work is able to uh, hit the king. And so in order to move the bishop you'd have to look into how the rook works, and you have to know where the king is. So, like, it actually may help to think about the, um, the different kinds of moves instead. Like, the, the different kinds of operations that we can perform on groups of objects, and not be too focused or even blinded by thinking of only individual objects. Um, the third thing, 
The third thing to note is how the hell do you get user input and draw this to the screen? And it's simple, just, just write a function. Use a graphics library, use a game engine, use a rendering framework, who cares? The same internal chess code can be used for text mode chess, OpenGL chess, Godot chess, um, Vulkan chess, web chess, RTX chess, who cares? Same code. And uh, moving on. So no engine, no problem. Uh, code written in a regular compiled programming language will work on anything. We can support multiple backends for different game engines, renderers, sound engines, or hardware. And uh, either way, we still have to do a bunch of rocket science. We can't just throw our game engine at a problem and expect it to be easier. It might even be harder. And with that aside, introducing OSP Magnum. This project is on GitHub at the moment. Uh, it is a C++20 project. Uh, every component is written as a separate library, because why not? And there's this, and one part of it is called the test application that will take all of these libraries and then use them to make tech demos. And it's been completely rewritten numerous times already. So this is the um, dependency graph. On the bottom, we can have we see the um, external libraries, Magnum and Corvée. Mag Magnum is used for the OpenGL renderer, as well as um, its utility library Corvée, and Entity for some containers. Magnum GL. This 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 is the OpenGL part, but yeah, it, the project gets its name from Magnum, of course, even though it's not actually that reliant on Magnum. Well, well, what it is, it's right there. But yeah, we have Jolt Physics for a physics engine and we got all of these little features like the planet terrain rendering is here the universe stuff is over here uh, links machines and vehicles these all have to do with vehicles active scene is kind of like a typical game engine scene graph like kind of like a physical world representation and this would use the other dependencies down here, of course, and what else do we have here? There's some things about drawing. OSP drawing, Adara drawing. I'm kind of surprised these aren't, this might be a mistake that they're not connected together, but um, yeah, there's Adara app takes all of these, like, like you see, this is one big spider at the top. It takes all of these features and then bundles them together into something, into something called, it, it bundles them into something called features. There's, there's, there's a framework over here, and a Dara app uses the framework in order to bundle together all of these code, all, all the code here to, to, to make it like, you, to make it composable so we can just add and remove them easily. And those features are used by the test application at the very top. Again, a test application just uses everything so the test application uses the framework and it has a bit of an API that's just open the application, add a scene, add a physics engine, add vehicles, add universe, add the renderer, and then hit run and it would just do its thing. And it comes um, preloaded with a few scenarios that would you know, add certain features to set up a little world. And I do have this, you know, it's, it's running in the background right now, but I kind of forgot this was running in the background, but um. This is the uh, vehicle scenario as shown here in vehicles. And I can fly these little vehicles around. I'll, 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 I'll get to what these are doing on the inside. But you know, look at, we got RCS, the engine plume system. There actually used to be an engine plume thing, but I've, uh, it's not, after, after the engine was rewritten a few times, that was just not added back yet. And the Jolt physics engine is pretty fast. So like, we can handle a lot of objects. And also I can change the scene, getting the terminal here. Um, so, well, the different scenarios. Oh, well, actually, first off, I, I can just um, close this window, close the window, and then just reopen it. And it's back. When I close the window, 
if you remember the context from earlier, it will close, it would remove the window context and the scene renderer. Because, because the renderer is completely separated, there's very little um, spaghetti that gets in the way of this being not possible. But um, if I change the scenario to like terrain, this is the terrain test scene. This is the um, Earth-sized planet. There's, there's some glitching because GPUs can't really handle huge numbers because note that this is as big as the Earth's diameter. And uh, yeah, I can just zoom out, move across the planet, zoom back in, and into uh, into a different spot in the world. And do note that there was um, e e e even though I just moved like I don't know if it's it's if it's in the millions, but like quite far from the origin of the world. And note that there was no there was very little to no jiggling. There was a little bit of um floating point jiggling, and that's because I set it to um. <coughs> The, the entire mesh would kind of recenter itself as I, as as I as I move around so yeah the mesh would be um the terrain mesh is still a high resolution this green cube here is 1 meter yeah so it's kind of recentering the mesh as I move around and there's very the terrain skeleton stuff actually uses integer coordinates partially so there is going on this in, in, in general I dealt with the um the precision issues so there's not much of a problem here and I can change scene to like um yeah phys physics scene I can't spell Yeah, the physics scene is the same as the vehicle test scene, but there's no vehicles. So I can throw a lot of balls and I can ch I can change the scene while the window is open. So and the universe test scene has the um, has the simple gravity simulation. And um, yeah, it can just get captured into one of these. Like you, you see, this is still like a regular. This is still a physics scene running here. But um, the universe is kind of being projected around it because the um, <clears throat> it's kind of hard, hard, hard to describe. But um, yeah, this is sort of the rotating planet kind of mathematics that we have to deal with. I'm I'm, I'm not really sure how to um best present this besides the rest of the presentation, but. Okay, well, that's that. So more about the uh, the framework. So stitching together a lot of libraries can be tedious. Uh, the test scenarios in the older versions of the code base were just a huge mess of code. So um, just just kind of a brief overview for now. I'm actually gonna get get more into this later. But um, there's like I I, I mentioned that the um, the the component Adara app would just get a bunch of features and package them into well something called a feature and yeah that's just what a feature is but um yeah we're gonna we, we have like individual features for things like vehicles the vehicle controls the rockets and the rocket plumes for that is just an example well there's not really rocket plume system it's more of a thrust indicator at the moment but <clears throat> if, if you think that this is running on like um, a client like if this was running on a player client, then we would need vehicle controls and we need rocket plumes, of course. But if this was a dedicated server, we don't need vehicle controls and we don't need rocket plumes because there's well there's not there's not gonna be any user input and there's not there's not gonna be any window to render to. So a dedicated server will only need vehicles and rockets, but not these two. And we have a way to just enable and disable them. And uh, yeah, there's also something called contexts. Just again, this is just these are um, major sections of the application, pretty much. So if you have like a scene or a window, 
like I showed before, like I, I, I can just close the window and reopen it. Like right now, the um, the the window is closed, but the scene is still existing. The scene context still exists. And I, and I and again, I can just run Magnum, Magnum, and that would reopen the window and recreate what's called a scene renderer, and it ju it just comes back. And yeah, again, they can be added and removing dynamically. So I check, yeah, changing the scenes, closing the window. That's exactly what I was doing previously. And there are four types of contexts um, right now. The first thing is the um, just what's called the main context, which hold which runs these commands, runs the commands that I can like type in here. Um, and it, and it manages the other scenes. The, 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 other, the, the, the other contexts. Um, and then there's the window, which runs the OpenGL context and Magnum application. The scene, well, yeah, that's the vehicles. It has a scene graph hierarchy in there as well. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that later. This, 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 this one's pretty interesting. And also the scene renderer, which is um, kind of like the, the, the glue between the scene and the window. And it would assign GPU resources to the scene and things like you know, Like technically, maybe we don't actually need a scene renderer, and we can just like read the scene. We we can just read the scene and just shove it through a function, and draw things directly to the window. But we're going to have to keep things as kind of a cache. Like uh, we're we're gonna have to like know which GPU stuff stuff are assigned to each each object in the scene, and we. It's not practical to just keep on regenerating that every single, every single frame. And yeah, also things like cameras and indicators, like where 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 is the camera stored? Like when 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 looking around, um, like the cam the camera doesn't need to be like on the OpenGL side. Like you, you might you might still want other systems to run and know where the camera is and not actually know exactly what the rendering backend is and stuff like that. But so. <clears throat> There's some stuff here that are GPU specific, and some things that are not. And yeah, the, currently there's only one scene that's hard coded in there. Multiple scenes are possible, but that's not used anywhere at the moment. And vehicle overview. So, for f I, I I didn't mention the very basic part here, but um, vehicles are made of a collection of parts, and any group of parts that are structurally connected together is referred to as a weld. So uh, actually, if, if, if the, the, these are things like um, just moving parts, like single moving parts. Like if you, if you think of a robot arm, every segment of the arm is going to be considered a weld. Um, and this is a non-tree structure. So unlike other games, you can make things like rings and other, other structures like that. And there, there, there is a wiring system. So, and this this adds a way to do not hard code the controls, and it's really easy to add new parts. Uh, we can control things like PID loops. Like we can we we can have PID control loops, and control engineering things. Like if 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 you think about adding um, like Im imagine having a differential thrust controller that you take the yaw pitch roll controls from the player from like the pilot capsule and then you run it through a differential thrust controller that and then that 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 would output throttle values for different rocket engines like we can do that and there's a unified there's a thing i call a link system and this is where the wiring the fuel flow and possibly different kinds of structural components all kind of run within the same loop so this makes it possible to like send a signal through different mediums within like a single frame. Like I can have a signal from a wire go into a solenoid valve, which would open up, you know, open a valve, electronically open valve, and then that would um, you know, uh, that would start making fuel flow through a fuel pipe and they'll activate a flow sensor. So we have the wiring system being turned into like a fluid signal and then into a flow sensor and back into a wire. So there's like a lot of this 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 gonna be a lot of things that we can do with this. And also it's physics engine independent, as in the way that the vehicles are represented as physics bodies is a separate problem. Like we, we, we don't care if um, the welds are actually made of like 30 different physics bodies and, or, or you know, if we have like 
a big wobbly rocket or anything like that. Like, I guess we, we can. We, we can just swap out how the physics are done for vehicles pretty easily. Like, if, if, if you're just writing code that deals with the fuel level of a fuel tank, you don't have to go into the physics engine and change things. Like, you're only dealing with just one system here, so... So I mentioned wiring. Um, so this is like a bit of a diagram of... This is not exactly what you have in the vehicle test scene because we don't have RCS blocks like this, but uh, parts as in like single structural units, you know, things that, uh, you know, a user can drag around and stuff. They contain multiple things called machines. And so we can have a single part with three rockets on it or in three like, you know, more technical components, RCS drivers. And they pass around information by reading and writing to something called nodes. I'm sorry that this, this, this comes from electrical engineering because this is functionally a sequential logic circuit simulator. And, you know, that, that's where this terminology comes from. But um, in, in, in this example, we have the pod, the command pod, which has a user control machine in it. And that would output pitch yarn, pitch yarn roll controls that can be read by the RCS controllers. The RCS driver it used to be called RCS controller, I'm sorry. But the RCS drivers will then convert the yaw pit, will then convert the pitch yaw roll controls into a throttle value that the rockets can use. And also, the, the, there's also a throttle connection connected directly to the main engine, which is also a rocket. Um, some things to note here is that, um, <coughs> I'm forgetting. Yeah, there's, there's no, there, I didn't include fuel here. Well, we don't we don't really have a fuel system at the moment. But uh, yeah, actually, I'm I'm not not gonna make any speculations at the moment. Um, okay, universe. So this is um, so first off, entities in space is or entities in space are referred to as satellites. And uh, so things like pl planets, vehicles, stars, etc. And we need things like nested coordinate spaces. So like, if like if if, if you think of like a patch like, I, again, we can support both end body and patch conics. But if you think about like like patch patch conics kind of uses multiple coordinate systems because you got things like spheres of influence. You can fly a satellite. Like you you, you can fly a vehicle to you know, to, to, to another, to, to, to another body. And then there's kind of a discrete time of um, switching. Like if you enter the sphere of influence, you would switch from one coordinate space to the other. If you were to transfer to a different planet or go to the moon or something like that. But an end body simulation does not have to do that. But either way, we're going to need nested coordinate spaces because if you think about there being like a thousand objects landed, landed on a planet, right? All of those objects have to move as the planet rotates, and yeah, like I know it's not really in well, ev everything's in space, but things landed are also like in space, so and and still part of something that we have to represent as part of the universe. Uh, so yeah, okay, patch conics and yeah, the universe uses sixty-four bit integer coordinates, and and that's practically a fixed point or something and we, uh, and we we can adjust the precision so we can say like 2 to the power of 10 units is equal to 1 meter that's roughly a millimeter of precision and when we scale up to like galaxies and things we can use um we can use a much lower precision so we have a bigger space i don't know if you can hear that motorcycle outside but um yeah, we currently have the mathematics for transferring satellites across uh, different coordinate spaces, and that, that that was shown in the universe, in the universe test scene actually. And should I even bring that back up? So yeah, in order to um like currently captured on this planet's coordinate space, and if I go far enough away, I would escape it. And now we are rotated. And now we. You know, the, the representation of the scene has been transferred from a planet surface and into, like, the single solar system. And now we've been transferred back onto a planet and moving far away. 
yeah, note that we are now rotated relative to the entire world. But yes, but that that the math for doing that exists. And yeah, the universe is very, very, very work in progress. We don't have a proper universe data structure. The um the universe test scene just kind of like um what's the right word to use this? Just allocates the array for the universe stuff on its own and just does 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 whatever the stuff. There's no like standardized way to like create universe, add planet. That's not yet. There's also the solar system test. That is that was contributed. And yeah, it does sort of a similar thing. This is running like a little n body simulation. And yeah, we, we, we don't have any proper orbit code. Like there was this branch that was also contributed a while back, um, but it has yet to have been re-added to the code base. And yeah, and into the code implementation. Okay, code philosophy. So one thing to note is that almost everything in the code base is an STD vector. It's almost kind of humorous, like trying to dig into how a certain subsystem works. You find a struct and a struct is just full of a bunch of members. And you look at what types each one of those members are and it's all just STD vector. You look at a weird type and not really understand what it is. So you control click it in the IDE. You look at the code implementation and it's just one STD vector or like three STD vectors. It's almost like it, it, it's all vectors all the way down. But um, yeah, again, sep separate everything. I think you probably got this notion from the previous slides, but like that means every component would have minimum dependencies. And that means individual components are easily testable. And the preferred way to like, you know, to actually, I haven't gotten that, that point yet, but yeah, shared variables is the preferred way to pass messages around. So like you'd have one thing that would write to a, to a queue or like just any variable, one thing writes to a variable and then another thing would read it later on. And this is just a preferred way to loosely couple code. So if you have, um, if you have just, if you, if you want two modules to be separate from each other, you just make them write, make one, just ha allocate an array or some, some something else in a top level. And when you call into them, you pass a reference to it. So like, okay, you write to this array and now you have an array and now you feed it to another system. And that that's used pretty much everywhere. And yeah, avoid the observer pattern or any, anything that like runs a function at any time. You won't find that many here. Like you're not gonna find like signals and slots and event listeners and things like that because those are generally buggy, I'll get to. Yeah, they're just general, gen generally buggy because you can't really control when things are changing at what time and that's random access. But what exactly do I mean by random access and like how is this avoided. So in a typical game engine, um, we usually have a, a bunch of objects with scripts in them. So if you have a rocket engine, for example, you would likely have a script that would um, drain fuel, apply physics thrust, play the sound and make particle effects. And this would interact with other objects in the world. This is currently the status quo in game dev, but it's very bug prone, spaghetti-ish and slow since every object can unpredictably modify. Yeah, I have some slides here. Yeah, ev any object can unpredictably modify anything anywhere, anytime. If we're doing things like adding and removing objects, then we're bound to get null reference exception every now and then since it's difficult to tell when an object is deleted. Things like operating on uh, multiple objects is ugly because uh, inevitably objects will need to interact and modify other objects. If an object can just be moving on its own with no scripts attached to it, then who knows what's moving it and what's the point of putting scripts in them then? And um, yeah, things like global behaviors is kind of ugly. Things like um, pausing the game and floating origin. Like when, when, when a game is paused, we can't just stop updating everything. There's still some code within some objects that we want to continue running. Like 
we might want to be able to select objects, look around with a camera, see visual effects, or navigate a user interface. The ugly part is that we'd often need code within each object that specifically checks if the game is paused, or, you know, the, the moment you hit pause, you have to loop through every object and disable them somehow. And this is ugly because there was a better way, of course. And lastly, I don't want to get too into the details, but this is also very, very inefficient to multi-thread. So if we let multiple threads access a fuel tank at the same time, then we need to deal with the complexity of synchronization between threads. One thread would have to like lock the fuel tank while it's using it, and another thread would just have to wait and sit. We'd have to sit and wait until it's done. And this, ha this is going to end up happening multiple times a frame for every object, leaving leading to horrible inefficiencies where a single thread might actually be faster. Yeah, because there, there are cases where, you know, using multiple threads will lead to a slowdown. The efficient way to multi-thread a problem involves organizing, you know, or organizing the problem into several large tasks where threads can run computations in isolation without other threads interfering with them. But with this architecture, we can't do anything. We, we, we can't do any of that. So moving on. So when we get to updating the world and running scripts uh, with, within you know, each object one by one, right? like for each object, object.update, the timeline kind of looks like this. There's many different kinds of objects. And here we just got rockets, wings, and fuel cells. But um, And each time we, we uh, run code in an object, that would reach out to different things. right? And we don't have much control over which order these objects run. And neither do we know which things an object accesses. Like if we have object.update, who knows what that's going to do? Like we don't know if that's going to, you know, read into fuel tanks. We don't know if that's going to access the physics engine, the sound engine, rendering. And we don't know. M maybe it sends an HTTP request. But um, uh, and we don't know like that much about what's going to happen. So it's kind of difficult to reason with the code. Let's see. the The wing only modifies the phys only touches the physics engine. The fuel cell only deals with fuel tanks. There's, there's going to be other stuff here, of course. I'm keeping it simple, and this is an intentionally wrong example because I'm I'm getting to what OSP does. But yeah, so what we instead do is we write features as single tasks that iterate multiple objects at a time. So a single task here, for example update all fuel flow, this would operate on everything, all, all, all the rockets and all the fuel tanks, and would deal with that all in one step. And, uh, and from here, we know which rockets are able to fire. So now we can update the rocket physics. The wing physics can just go along with that, um, update the rocket sounds, and then update the rocket effects. As in, but like, yeah, of course, we're going to be iterating all the rockets multiple times here. That's actually fine if you think about it closely. But um, yeah, actually, the thing to note is that these three tasks, uh, they don't interfere with each other. Like, they all read from rocket output values, but they all write to different things, right? Which means um, it's quite easy to run this in parallel. Parallelizable, right. So instead of running a single timeline, we instead have tasks that depend on each other, right? So this is a this is something called a task graph. This is standard terminology. When one task completes, it unlocks other tasks to be allowed to run. And this is still not what we have in OSP, but it's quite close. And the efficiency of this Actually, not yet, but like, yeah, the efficiency of this depends on how we represent data. And um, yeah, and the common way that data is represented in OSP is using unique integer IDs. So instead of object object equals new object, we just make a number. Uh, and we, 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 we can assign data to things by using arrays and maps. So in this example, we have an array of entity names. Well, this can also just be a map as well. An array or a map, they kind of look the same in this example. And by setting the key, 
use using the entity ID as a key, we can assign a property to the thing we're calling entities here, and as well as another one for color. So this is how we represent an orange cube by using two separate arrays or, or, or maps. You, this can also be called um, structure of arrays for as a more technical term. If you, and yeah, and since we're going to have um, we're going to have things like part IDs, node IDs, machine IDs, entity IDs, and other things. It's really easy to get them mixed up. So there's something in the code called a, called a strong ID that would wrap these into types, into more stronger types. And that, that, would, that would prevent mix-ups a lot of the time. And so there's something called an ID registry type. And this is something that would handle creating, deleting, and checking if IDs exist or listing off all the IDs that are currently present. If they, the, the IDs that it generates start at zero and would increment. So this is really good for array indices because this, this, it, 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 would, it, it's, it would pack the, um, the memory very efficiently. And deleted IDs are reused. So if I delete entity one here and I immediately create a new ID, it's, gonna be, it's ID is going to be one. And entity component system, I don't know. Like, and that's what, if, if, if you just look around the game dev world, there is something called entity component system. And whether OSP falls into this category, I don't know, because there's so many conflicting definitions of what an entity component system is. But uh, moving on. The advantages of this is that it's, um, well, compared to like a conventional class or object, you know, object, object equals new object. Um, this is very, very fast and multi-threadable because um, threads can work on separate arrays. Like you can read the same IDs, but you can write to separate, separate arrays. You know, one thread can be doing this, the other thread can be doing that very, very easily. Um, IDs and, and, you know, IDs and array indices refer to multiple types at a time. So like we, we again, we can, like in, a, like in a previous slide, we can store multiple different properties associated with a single ID. And there's no need for smart pointer and reference spaghetti um, to represent relationships between between our uh, things. I'll, 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 I'll get to this. I'll elaborate more, more onto this later. And also bit vectors become really useful. This is when you use um, bytes. You use bytes as an array of bits. Um, and this can be used to represent a set of um, IDs. So in this example, we got, you know, 110000. Zero 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 one zero. So like um, the bit bit indices go from right to left. So bit zero is on the right, and bit seven is on the left here. And we can see that bit one is set to one. Bit one, bit six, and bit seven are set. So this byte can represent a set of numbers one, six, and seven. And this is really useful if you want to make like if you want to like make a list of entities or something that are unique. It's we, ju we just use a bit set, and that's one bit per entity, so it's, it's, it's really fast. And also, we have 64-bit integers. We can operate on 64 or more bits at a time. There's a ton of optimizations we can do with this. And fun fact, the, um, the ID registries that I mentioned earlier, they're just a single bit set, where you know 0 represents a used ID and 1 represents a free ID that we can, you know, and th 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 there's a lot of fun stuff we can do with this. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's just really efficient. And yeah, the stupid fast iterate and <clears throat> arrays and bit vectors have the have the um the best worst case performance. And um the the worst case is when you have thousands of stuff thousands of stuff on screen and uh, you know ev every other container like if you have like a list of objects you know, like if you have, if you have a regular array where you know you you just have like an array of numbers, for example, every number is going to be like, you know, four bytes, eight bytes, or something like that. So like, the more stuff you have, the bigger this thing gets. And things like maps and sets and linked lists, there's a lot of overhead for each new element that you add. And arrays and bit vectors just pretty much don't. Like, if 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 we have like two thousand, you know. To, to 2,000 objects in the world, 
and we represent that with 2000 bits. That's just like a handful of bytes, you know. Div div divide that by eight. And, it's, and when it's full, it's still the same size. When it's empty, it's still the same size. And the, and the thing is, it, the, 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 the empty spaces, like if we delete an ID and we have an empty space in an array, that doesn't actually matter because, well, if there's not many things, then the performance matters less. Like, you know, the performance in the worst case is what we care about. And anyways, the, perf the performance loss from having empty spaces in a bit vector or an array is very, very minuscule anyways. If that's if, you're worried, if you notice the large, that's if you even notice that, you know, holes would appear if we delete things. And yeah, and this is actual actual code as an example. This is how OSP represents vehicles for an entire scene. So the vehicle parts, we have this ID registry that would keep track of which part IDs exist and don't exist. And if, if we want to create a new part, we say part IDs dot create, and that would create a, get us a new unique ID. And there's something called a prefab. Um, and I, I, I'll explain prefabs later, but there's, there, then there's stuff to do with the weld, like I mentioned earlier. Transforms relative to the weld. And down here is an int array multimap. Like, my, my machines here don't worry about this, but int array multimap, and this is just like, this maps one integer to many integers. And there's also part two. This, this, this represents the relationship of there being multiple parts in one weld. And that also means that each part is associated to one weld. So this is kind of like a two-way map. If we want to get which parts, if we want to get which parts um, a weld contains, then we can just use this container. We can use this map to access that. And if we want to get which weld a part is part of, then we can use this way. And uh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, machines and nodes are here. And there's some other vectors here, something called an active entity. And that's actually, I note that it's just each part is associated with an active entity. And this is just a two-way map, part to active, active to part. No, don't worry about that. Um, and there's something, and yeah, I, I active, act, active entity, that's something I'm going to get into exactly next. So, um, do you know that how I mentioned that the that the typical game engine object hierarchies are not really needed? One thing that these so-called scene graphs are useful for is representing a three-dimensional scene. And that's sort of a standard. Like the format we use for vehicle parts and 3D assets in general is GLTF. And the the, the GLTF format uses a typical parent-child hierarchy of nodes. So it makes sense that we use something similar. So yeah, active entity. But yeah, older versions of um older versions of OSP from years ago uses the everything is an entity approach, but that was painful and overcomplicated and it's refactored out thankfully. And active entities are only really used for like physics and things that benefit from having a physical representation. So yeah, active entities are just integers. Like ID and entity are kind of like an interchangeable thing, and just kind of a historical thing about um. Like in instead of calling some things IDs and calling other things entities, it's kind of just really the same thing. But yeah, this again, this is mostly used for physics or any kind of physical representation. I just kind of forgot to click here, but um. Yeah, the the ID registry for active ends are elsewhere, but the implementation of like the parent-child scene graph is actually pretty funny. So to represent a parent and child, we got this, um, we got just a few arrays for all the entities in the scene. We got an array of descendant counts. So if, if, if we look at entity, you know, entity G here, G has two descendants, you know, H and I, just two children. And F has three, you know, G, H and I. So F has a three. And that's just the size of the subtree below it. So this is a very, very, very simple way to like represent a tree structure. It's stupidly fast to iterate. So if I want to iterate an entire subtree, if I want to iterate everything, I just 
loop through it like a regular array. Again, like I map, I map each position within the tree to an active entity, and I just iterate this as a normal array. And I know I can I can just loop through the entire scene like that. This 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 is this is actually used for things like calculating the uh, the transforms used for rendering. So like you know if I can, I can, in things like Blender you can parent an object to another object, and I'll make like a chain of parents. And if that iteration is just walking on array, then that's ultra fast. And if I just want to do something like iterate the children, then I can just skip over all all the de de all the descendants based on the descendant count. <clears throat> so if I want to iterate all the children of A, that would be B and E. I, st I start at A. I see that it has a descendant count that's non-zero. So I just go to the next array. And then I see a 2, so I just skip over 2. And now we got E. So that's B and E. And I, I get a 4 here, so I just skip over 4. And th th there actually is some machinery to, to make this very clean. But you might notice that this might be slow to randomly modify. Like, if I want to add a new child to D or something like that, I want to add a new child that's up here, that's between A and B, I'm going to have to move the entire array, like shift the entire array towards the right so I can add a new element. But the thing is, we never actually have to do this. And I, 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 again, this is about you know the no random access part again. Like I mentioned, we're not going to be random. We're not going to be randomly modifying things, so this is not actually a problem. And yeah, we we have fast operations on multiple elements at a time. If you think about you know problems like if you were to add a single number to like an array of of all like if you have an array that's already sorted and you want to add an extra number to it. Right, you're going to have to like find a point in the middle where the new number can fit in, and then shift all the elements to the side. And if if we're going to be adding multiple elements, you're going to have to shift the array multiple times to add all the elements in there. But if we just add multiple elements at the same time, then that's that's pretty much the same problem as merging together two arrays, merging together two sorted arrays, or something like that, kind of like a merge sort. So again, when we operate on multiple elements. Um, a bunch of you know more optimized algorithms will pop up, and and, and in order to avoid in, in in order to do this, we need to like we need to do things like keep a list of things to delete and then delete them all at once near the end. And this uh, this actually is not much of a problem, uh, which I'll, I'll I'll elaborate on this a little more. So this this is the code for the uh, for the scene graph. This is the exact same example here, but in code form. We have we have something called the tree position, which is just on a thirty two bit unsigned integer. And yeah, there's also a, a a list of parents that I kind of skipped. I I just skipped it in the example, but yeah, this is what the code looks like. We got a list of things to delete, but I don't actually know if this is used, but um. I think this might be used for as an intermediate processing step, but we got uh, yeah. This is the descendant counts and the entity map. And oh, this is this is Godot for comparison. So every time you create an object in Godot, every time you create a node, it, you call it node in Godot. It's it, it's gonna t it, it's going to have to like manage this big, huge parent-child hierarchy, and it has raw pointers for the parent, and it has a huge hash map for all the children. And note it's, it's reliant on string names. Like I, I know I mentioned, I use names as an example, but we actually almost never rely on names. And, and, and if you look at it, um, each, um, I haven't calculated this exactly because um, I'd, I'd, I'd have to compile Godot and you know, put 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 some code in there to actually check the size of each node, but it but it will turn out to be around three hundred bytes of multiple allocations. And note that if we want to iterate this, if you want to like you know walk through all of the children's all the children's children, or anything like that, we're going to have to read the hash map, read a hash map here, and that's not going to be fast compared to just a single array that needs to be iterated. 
<clears throat> so again, like, no random access. How? So, um, instead of, you know, deleting entities at random and getting no reference exception everywhere, we have to, like, accumulate a list of entities to delete, and then delete them all at the same time, you know, near the end of the frame. And this means that we have to complete all the tasks that would fill the list of entities to delete before we run all the tasks that will use that list. And that perfectly fits into a task graph. But, um, dude, let's explain this thing first, actually. So we have to, like, when we're finished these tasks, when we're finished the task, task of filling, you know, requesting entities to delete, actually, I have to be finished both of these, you see, for these two to be unlocked. And, and the, note that the order, the order at which these, um, these tasks run doesn't actually matter. One can finish before the other. Just that when both of them are finished, note that, you know, each one of these depends on both of them, which is why we have, like, four connections here. And once, you know, once, once we're done using the list and deleting the entity IDs, we delete the data. Then um, we can then move on to clearing the list so that next frame we can delete more things, request more things to delete, actually delete them, and then clear it for the next frame. But note that that we have to like set four dependencies here. And if you want to add a new task, if you want to add a new task that would you know request to delete even more entities, then we'd have to pretty much add three more dependencies. No, is that the B3? Like B1, two, wait, one, two. That'd be two more dependencies. Yeah, we have to add two more dependencies. So it's kind of like the number of the number of tasks here versus multiplied by the number of tasks here. And it, it's just really, really inconvenient to add new tasks, which is the issue with the task graph. So we're going to have to like set foot into unknown territory and introduce something called the pipeline. So this is um, tasks will, in, instead of, you know, directly depending on each other, right, we instead have something called a pipeline here, this purple thing in the middle. And tasks will synchronize to the stages of the pipeline here. So request entities to delete, request more entities to delete, request more entities to delete. These, this is part of the, the same example as previously. And these, these are so-called synchronized or synced with the fill stage. And it doesn't matter which one runs first as well. And yeah, this would roughly control access to certain variables and resources and <clears throat> There's, there's only one like current selected stage, and once all all the ta all the tasks on this stage is complete, you move on to the next stage and do all the tasks here. And yeah, the order at which within stage doesn't the task order within stages doesn't really matter. And as an example here, we have the fill, use, and clear to control some kind of queue or vector or list of entities to delete. And this is this is just more of a diagram of the equivalent structures we got. So again, these two have to run first, and then these two can run, and then that. And it's the same structure here. These two tasks have to run first, and then these two tasks can run, and then you know we clear it. But then we can move on and make things more complicated. So um, tasks can sync to multiple pipeline stages. So instead of just you know requesting entities to delete, here I've actually added a pipeline for entity IDs, for example, and delete. It has a delete stage when we actually delete entity IDs and then create new IDs, and that's because the best time to the best time to add new things is right after we delete things. So when you know, because when we delete things, we leave a bunch of empty spaces, and also the newly deleted stuff is fresh in the memory cache, so it's best to be used right away. But I'm not going to go into how. Yeah, that, that that's actually a little advanced. But um, <clears throat> so the way that we access the list of entity, actually, you know, like this is like a persistent, a persistent container of entity IDs in the world. Is that yeah? We 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 delete everything. We create new ones and then modify. Just anything that wants to read entity IDs would be synchronized to this stage ready. 
And yeah, this has a cylindrical topology, if you note. Like, note that these kind of loop along the sides. So we don't actually know if, you know, clear list, for example, is going to run before or after the quote unquote frame. Like, I'm, I'm not actually going. Like, like, this one thing I glossed over a little bit is where is the, like, the, you know, the start and the end, right? Like, <clears throat> usually if we think of a game or something, there's like, we start updating the world, we go through a process, and then we stop, or something like that, and then we wait for the next frame. But here it's, a, it's, it's kind of vague. We don't actually know. But um, we don't care exactly when tasks run, but they run at the right time. So this, this clear list thing can actually go at the beginning because it, it, it would still be perfectly valid if we just clear the list of entities to delete before we use it instead of clearing it after we use it. Like the start and the end of the frame. Like, I'm, 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 like I, know, I know this is kind of difficult to like wrap one's head around. I, I don't have my head completely around this as well, but this system just works in the code. And I, I think it works particularly well because it's just the the funda th this matches the fundamental topology of like what I'd call like the perfect ga perfect game loop and um yeah we can just add more stuff like we just bam we can we, we can we can just add new things very easily and all the dependencies we kind of sort themselves out so in this ex this is just an example as well like this is not exactly what we have in OSP but um now we've added entity transforms and you see, when we delete entity transforms, we are synchronized with the delete stage for entity transforms and also the use stage for, because we are using the list of entities that we want to delete. And we're also modifying the array of entity transforms. And you know, once we do, we do the physics update here and then maybe render it because transforms will be modified by the physics update. And say, for example, the physics update also needs entity IDs for some reason. <clears throat> and yeah, when we create new entities, we're going to need to create new entity transforms. I don't have like an entity creation queue or anything here. But yeah, that's that. Um, there's, there's some other features with pipelines here. And that's it, that, that is well, t tasks will have to run on a certain pipeline just kind of for organizational purposes, like, because it's kind of hard to know when, when a task actually needs to run. You can't just like in queue a task or something like that. But um, <clears throat> there's also something called, uh, pipelines can also can be like canceled. That would prevent, that would disable other tasks from being able to run on it. There's, there's usually something called a schedule stage that handles this. <clears throat> there, there was a parent-child hierarchy of pipelines where if the if the root where like you know the, the parent pipeline gets cancelled all of the children and all of the children's children all the, all, the all the descendants will be cancelled as well. And there's also something with there's also nested loops so like I mentioned the cylindrical topology and the game loop because the game loop is like one pipeline at the very top. And what if we want like another loop in there? Because you know, like, well, one thing that the, the vehicle wiring and link system does is that it loops multiple times in order to get a signal to propagate across multiple elements. Like if you think about having a long line of logic gates, you're going to have to deal with like updating them at the right order. And part of that is tossing around like lists of changes and stuff like that in such a way that it, it would um, kind of have to run a nested loop and things would have to depend on that. And to still be able to add new systems like fuel and different kinds of machines. <clears throat> and also there's, there's something called an external signal. And that's where a single stage on a pipeline can be set as, you know, this is set to wait for a signal. And this would stop the pipeline from advancing to the next stage unless externally allowed. So like, for example, requesting a next frame from the window application. So I can think of this like a machine of like, you know, you, 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 you hit a button and then it starts running through a process and then it finishes. And then you can hit the button again, it starts running the process and it finishes. So like when, when, the, um, when the window application requests a frame, like, okay, you need to render something right now. 
the request to the request to render a frame would come in as a signal, and the pipeline would render a frame. And then once that's once the pipeline is done for rendering a frame, whether whether that that's just swapping a buffer or drawing a lot of things to a canvas, it's going it's going to reach its finished stage, and then we can read that. And then we can just run. We can request another frame afterwards, but yeah, and pi pipelines were just infinite loop without a signal stopping it. So, the, the like again, yeah, the, the the game loop is a single pipeline that loops at the very top, and other things like that. Um, and also, uh, there's a, there's a separate executor, but we we only have a single threaded one. But so all the, all, all the pipelines and tasks and stuff. This is just a big like a big struct and a bunch of arrays and things uh, that just store what things are d connected to what, among other things. And it's up to like a separate executor to read the structure and actually run the functions. So yeah, pipeline types. So like if, if you look in this file, src Adara app feature interfaces, you would find that there's, this, this is how the different kinds of pipelines are declared. It's declared with an enum class, <clears throat> and this this one example here. This example here is the ESTG inter for intermediate container, and this is a container that's you know filled, used, and then cleared right away. Like I'm using fill, use, and clear. Like I've I, I've used those terms in the previous example, but in the code, it's actually resize, modify, schedule, use, run, clear. No, it is. It's just clo it's close enough, and it is often used as like the message passing medium. You know, one system would fill a container, and then another system would read from it, and the pipeline kind of makes sure that this happens in a correct order. And yeah, and the schedule is used here to like um, because ta tasks can run can run on, like I mentioned, like tasks can run on a certain pipeline, so that so that it, so that the task can be canceled and other things. So yeah, we can have a, ta a special task on the schedule stage that would check if the container is empty. And if it's empty, it would cancel the pipeline. So we don't actually have to run the tasks that would just iterate an empty container anyways. There's something called a, a continuous container. And this is the, um, you, you kind of saw this on a previous example as well. And this, is, and this controls access to like data that persists and is modified over time. So things like you know transforms, things like physics and whatnot, but and it's also something called an optional path, right here, and this will this would cancel a group of tasks all at once, and it's it's kind of like a control flow path, like if you have like an if statement or a while loop or something like that, the group of stuff in it is kind of like a, you know a path that execution can take, and yeah, tasks would often run on these. So these things things like the scene update. The scene render and stuff like that; those are contained within an optional path. Um, yeah, there's something called an event as well. Um, it, it, it's 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 not really used very often, but this is something that has like a conventional start and end. Uh, and there's there's some weird ones like FBO. This is for rendering. ESTG link. This is like. This is a, a nested loop that I mentioned earlier, where we'd have to, again, lo loop multiple times in order to send a signal to multiple components. And also something called reversed, which is just working around a bug. And actually using the system, so this is the, from, you know, SRC Adara app features shapes.cpp. This is this uses um, the shape spawning system in order to, you know, Actually, I I can just show it in action. But um, if I open the physics test scene, the sh the shape spawning system here, this code on the on the screen here, uh, spawn blocks every two seconds. It's this right here. These are the blocks being spawned every two seconds, and it's doing that. There's um, and this this is the task that will handle the timers, which is just a single float, float timer, and it just adds the time to it every single f every single update. And if the timer exceeds two seconds, it would subtract the time. So it's this is just this is again this is regular code. 
Like there's no special, like I, I, at least from this part here below, it's just regular C++ code. And the weird stuff is up here. <clears throat> and this would run on PL update. This is a this is an optional path update, because like, actually I'll, I'll get to it in a moment. But like, up updating the world is optional. It's kind of like a path that can be disabled. If because there's kind of multiple scene support, but multiple scenes are not used yet. So if we don't want to update a scene, we don't update this. But um, yeah, this would synchronize with. Like it's it, it's called sync with, and this is a fizzshapes.pl.spawn request. This is a pipeline. This is a, and a, the spawn request vector, which is just this variable down here. This uses, um, what do you call it again? An, an intermediate container. Because this, this would just be cleared at the end of the frame. And uh, there's, there's something called data IDs up here, but I'm not going to worry about those. But it, either way, the correct variables get obtained from the world, and then we just modify it as regular code. <clears throat> I know that there's a bug here. Well, but because the, because the, the 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 delta time, we don't actually know who sets the delta time. So there's just a mi minor bug that uh, we don't we don't actually know if delta time is being accessed correctly. We can have sync with delta time up here, but uh, that's not an issue because delta time is currently hard coded to one sixtieth of a second, one sixtieth of a second at the moment. So yeah, again, ma main loop. So I mentioned the um, <clears throat> I mentioned optional paths and stuff like that. So the main loop pipeline is running, like like the entire application can like the execution of the application can be represented as a single main pipeline running at the top. And this this can loop faster than the current frame rate, and we have an optional path that would say should this scene be updated, and you know that this is scene pl that update you saw earlier, and then there's another optional path for should this scene be rendered, you know scene pl dot render. So we can run this loop as fast as we can, or we want to you know we can only or, or we can do something where we detect if, you know where we only loop if we need to. And if there's nothing to do, we just don't do anything. <clears throat> but either way, um, that's kind of like the main update structure at the top. And um, yeah, one, th one thing to note is that there's, there's, there's some terminology, which is th there's something there called sync, in, um, which you, you would find in this pipeline. This would kind of run alongside the scene update, and the, this would synchronize the GPU rendering resources without actually doing any drawing. So like you know in, in in most games you have, you know, you you have update and you have draw. But here we have sync as well. Well, you know, because this is sometimes that the um and this would just read things from the scene and assign, you know, drawable stuff to them. And the reason why this exists is that render can be skipped, right? We might want to skip frames. We might want to like do things that are required for drawing. But not actually draw anything. Um, so yeah, if 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 we choose to skip frames, actually, but or or else this would just be tied to the scene update or the vendor. And yeah, this would usually the sync step. You 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 just find sync mentioned here and there all over the code base, but this usually only iterates things when they change. So there's like a list of changes or dirty flags, if you know what those are. <clears throat> so that when something is not changing, it won't be iterated, it won't be updated by the sync step. And there's also something called resync. And this is the same as sync, but it will iterate everything. Like when we change the scene or we change the renderer. Like when we, when we change the scene, we're going to have to loop through everything and assign GPU resources to all of them, or else we'll just get a blank screen. So yeah, the advantage to all of this pipeline crap is that it's extraordinarily composable. Like we can just throw features together and then the pipelines would kind of automatically resolve the dependencies between them. And yeah, it's still parallel multi-threadable and stuff like that. And it perfectly fits the control flow requirements of, you know, the problems in OSP or kind of just the game loop in general. And that's because pipelines were emerged 
as a result of iterating on this project in the first place. So it's kind of the other way around. Like pipelines were made for OSP, not that I made pipelines and shoved OSP into it or something like that. And uh, but yeah, I, 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 I'd additionally note the current the current reality of things is that the pipeline executor is a bit incomplete. It has a few bugs. Like I, I mentioned that there's like a reversed pipeline back there, and that's because there's certain patterns that just don't work with it. And uh, you know, it, it it would hit assets in some parts of it, and it, I it would show a funny message funny message or something like that. And yeah, everything is currently tied to the window frame rate. So I mentioned there's a sync step and the stuff like the sync step. The scene update sync and does does render or draw, and all of that's just tied together because who cares? And there there was there was actually some history about the um the tasks and frame. No, actually, I, I just think it's important to discuss some of the history of the tasks and framework system. So if you look at this old commit, probably from twenty seventeen or something, about on something called system vehicle or the vehicle system. <clears throat> there was uh, something here called function order previously, where it's just a list of functions with string names. So like, you know, th th there, was a, there was a function called update vehicle modification, and this has a string name, vehicle modification, and we have another function that would depend on vehicle modification, which would run after vehicle modification. This thing barely worked. So luckily it was removed, okay, back in 2021. I removed this and then I replaced it with just a a bunch of function calls. So, so you know, if I had like, you know, at, at at one point it was just like scene update and it just calls a long list of functions. I see. Uh, I showed that to a C programmer one time and then he said that it was the most maintainable thing ever. And yeah, a little later into the future, there was um there was something called sessions and session groups. This is fairly recent actually. Um. So it, this, it, it first used something called the tag task, which is the tag task scene graph, which is just a regular scene graph, but instead of tasks depending directly on each other, the, the tasks can depend on something called a tag. So some tasks can fulfill a tag and some tags, some tasks will depend on a tag. So if you mentioned like the, the absurd amount of, like I mentioned, you need a ton of dependencies for each task added, you know, tag task was like an initial realization of that. And this was quickly replaced with pipelines because it didn't it, it was really, really ugly to implement the wiring system. So yeah, it was I just kind of like pi pipelines was kind of built around OSP and the wiring system specifically. Like I needed something that's able to perfectly represent the the control flow required there. And yeah, and you have to manually specify all the dependencies between you know, these things called session, sessions. Well, these, all of these functions are returning something called a session, and they all depend on each other. So if you look at these, you look at, you know, scene common here, you know, the material for something called, actually, no, just setting up a generic material ID, and that depends on common, the physics engine, or it's not the physics engine, it's just generic physics. Generic physics, depends on scene common and actually th these two are not sessions but yeah the, the physics engine we used before was called newton dynamics so this is like generic physics for physics up here and newton here is a specific physics engine and this depends on physics and i made like a little graph here like yeah this mess here is represented with this and in order to add like if, if i wanted to modify the dependencies of one of these features I would have to modify it here. I'd have to modify in every place that this feature is used. I'd have to modify the header. I'd have to modify the source, and you know, call a bunch of macros and things that to to make it work. So this was actually incredibly tedious. Albeit it was the it was a fairly correct structure. It was horrendously tedious, and if it was removed September of 2024, which is just last month, and it's replaced with the current framework system. And that the thing here called sessions was replaced with something called features and feature interfaces. And uh, whatever was called session groups became context, which is just the same one I just I skimmed over. So yeah, moving on, the current framework implementation is pretty much just a convenient interface 
a convenient interface around pipelines and task and tasks. Um, like and it, and it also does the job of storing data of any type as data IDs. So like I can, I can, if you remember the um the example with the the shape spawning system, the 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 one that would spawn the blocks, it would store a timer and then it would also access data for, you know, the array of requests of shapes to request. And that's stored as data IDs. And there's also something called fe like I mentioned fe feature interfaces. And this is um and a, a feature interface will reserve what data and what pipelines uh, a, fe a certain feature will use. And features will actually like add the tasks and it will configure the pipelines instead of just reserve them. And we'll also construct the data for the data IDs. And it's also implement and depend on multiple feature interfaces. So I, 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 I can look, so feature interfaces are kind of like a declaration and the features are a definition. No, I think I got that I got that backwards. No, feature interfaces are like a definition and the features are like a declaration. Oh my god, I'm some actually Yeah, I'm some sorry, I I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I'm getting this backwards or not, but um Yeah, feature interfaces are like a declaration and features are like a definition. <clears throat> yeah, so you have one feature will implement a feature interface and another feature will depend on the feature interface. And that makes it so that I can declare all the feature interfaces first and then I can start adding features without without them de directly depending on each other. It, that's just like kind of just the fundamental fundamental theorem of software engineering, you know, add another layer of indirection, it fixes every problem. And again, there's something called the context, which and the context is pretty much just tracks what feature interfaces are used. Like, <clears throat> so if I have the window, I, you know, I can, I can add features to the window, I can have a scene, I add features to the scene, and only one type of each feature interface is allowed. So I can't have two physics engines, or I can't have, you know, two of the same things. I'd have to I'd have to make two separate contexts to make that work. And yeah, there's um this this file here, this little unit test, OSP Magnum test framework main.cpp. There was there was like a an example here that used like an aquarium of fish, as as well as a detailed explanation of how to like use the framework. I'm sorry, my throat's really dry. <coughs> So um, yeah, this is what the code looks like. So for in this example, we got Jolt, Jolt Physics, which is the physics engine, and we got the vehicle spawner, which is a just kind of an internal feature. And the vehicle spawner will implement the vehicle spawn feature interface, and the Jolt Physics will implement the the Jolt Physics feature interface. And we can have like these are two separate features, and again like. The list of arguments, like this, this, this is a this is a function. Uh, uh, this is a th these are function arguments, by the way. I'm sorry, if that's difficult to tell. So this is declaring a lambda, a lambda function. And th th there's a magical system in here that would act it's actually able to read. I would iterate and read these function parameters, and would and it would see like, oh, you want to implement the vehicle spawn feature? Then okay, now I can use vehicle spawn dot data ID or vehicle spawn dot pipeline and do stuff with that. <clears throat> and if, if if I want, you know, I can I can then add like another feature that would um depend on both vehicle spawning and jolt. And I, I can name that vehicle spawn jolt. And you can see it depends on jolt and it depends on vehicle spawn. Right? It's implemented here and it's dependent on here. As, and same same thing with Jolt, but um, yeah. And the composability of this is just this just kind of looks like this. This is, this is the physics test scenario. Like, look how similar the physics test scenario looks. So if I open the physics test scenario again, like we got the you got the physics engine, we got you know we got the shape spawner, we got the droppers, and there's also like another thing that would it throw the balls when you press space. That that's another task that does that. And if you look at the vehicles test scene, it's exactly this. It's pretty much exactly the same thing, but we have vehicles here, 
and that's ex that's that's this is perfectly mirrored in a code. Again, like if if, if you look at the the this is the physics test scenario. We got features specific to Jolt, and we got our stuff up here. And note that these this block of code is exactly the same as this block of code. Well, a a a a, a bit, but. Yeah, we got prefabs, parts, sig yeah, prefabs, parts, signals, floats, vehicle spawn. Like this is the vehicle specific things, and we also have some things vehicle spawn jolt. That this this was in the um, this was in the other ex other slide, the other example. But yeah, we also got stuff like rocket thrust jolt. So this is um, this is a feature that depends on rockets and also depends on jolt, right? So like. <clears throat> so we have a physics engine and we have vehicle stuff and we need we need a, a feature that's able to interrupt these two and that's what these do you know vehicle spawn f physics shapes jolt as well yeah and yeah this constant acceleration is gravity and it configures it down here other than that that's actually That's pretty much all I have for now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, thanks for listening.